it's time for week eight of Sabbath School Boot Camp. Now, the purpose of boot camp is to help you think creatively and critically about your Sabbath School lesson. This lesson is entitled Ministering Like Jesus. So let's lace up those boots and get moving. Starting on Sabbath, there's a point that I want to draw your attention to in the lesson. Quote, Jesus recognized that the world needed a demonstration of the gospel as much as it needed a proclamation. Now, that's a, a profound point. We often think of evangelism primarily in terms of proclamation. I'm going to organize this event so I can deliver information. I want people to accept the information. And, but my job is purely to deliver it and then let God do the rest. Look, that approach enables us to believe that the ends may justify the means, right? What matters is that I convey the gospel message, the gospel information. And if I have to maybe scare people with beasts or hide the name of my church from the brochure, I'll do that because I want them to hear it. That's my mission, to get them to hear it, whatever it takes. If I'm not as careful with my historical facts, I mean, it's fine, right? Because all that matters is that they come and hear the gospel. And I'm not saying this is a widespread thing. I'm not saying anyone out there is being dishonest intentionally, nor that it's wrong to talk about the beasts of Bible prophecy, okay? I'm not saying any of that. I'm simply saying that this idea of evangelism as an information download can sometimes do some damage because in our efforts to build that bridge between someone and God, we have to ask ourselves, how many bridges do we also burn for every bridge that we built? And what sort of people do we create when we see evangelism primarily as the conveying of dates and facts and numbers and ideas? When you look at how Paul did evangelism, for instance, sure, he preached on the, on the Sabbath, right? He went into the synagogue, he preached to the Jews and to the God-fearing Gentiles there. But then the other six days of the week, he lived among the people that he was preaching to. They saw him at work, they saw him at home, they saw him at the market. Paul was, I think we can all agree, the greatest evangelist who ever lived. And I don't think it was because of his Sabbath sermons. He was probably a great preacher. But I don't think that's where his appeal lay. I think it was because he lived with these people and they saw his kindness every day. They saw with their own eyes how God was shaping and molding and changing and transforming this man. The disciple Thomas, just to give you another example, he wasn't interested in the proclamation that his Lord had risen. He was interested in a demonstration of Jesus' presence in the world. So I want you to imagine that you've agreed to go preach an evangelistic series somewhere, okay? You're going to get over your, your nervousness about that. Uh, many of you may have. Some of you guys are veterans. You're good with this. Okay, so you're going to preach somewhere. you got a, a city. Uh, you got, you got some planning to do. So think about the topics that you would talk about. What is it that's important to tell people? What do you want them to accept before they're able to be baptized? Are you going to meet in a church? Or are you going to rent a hotel room or something? How are you going to advertise it? Are you going to send out flyers, maybe some social media advertising? How do you want the local church to help you? Do you want them to organize and hit the streets talking about your upcoming meetings? How many people do you see showing up? Okay, so we're going to take all those plans and set them aside. And then let me ask you this one question about all of those plans. How would these plans change if you knew you had to stay in that city for a year, living and working alongside the people that you are proclaiming the gospel to. Are we as good at demonstrating the gospel in our lives as we are in talking about it? Because when we see evangelism as mere talk, mere information, we don't necessarily have to love these people. But the reality is Jesus loved these people. He spent time around these people. And as that, that quote from Ministry of Healing, page 143 says, that's quoted in the lesson, Christ mingled with people and desired their good. He showed them sympathy and he helped out with their needs. And only when he had won their confidence 
did he say, come, follow me? See, I think we, we far more often are, 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 we skip ahead to inviting people to follow God. We just cut to the chase. Let's just invite them to follow God. We don't first try to win their confidence. We may love them, but only as potential converts. This is a hard saying, and I think we all need to reflect on how we think and do evangelism. I personally think we need more demonstration to go along with our proclamation. It's just, it's too easy to fly into a city and then leave six weeks later proclaiming victory, right? And, and we never really connected with the people that, that we want to preach the gospel to. Okay, sliding over the Sunday where we find some more juicy things to consider. First up is the idea that Jesus always looked for the good in others and drew the best out in them. In so doing, he offended the religious establishment. Look, Jesus is eating with tax collectors. Oh no! The problem here isn't hard to understand. Your mama told you not to hang out with the wrong crowd, didn't she? Because they will rub off on you. The idea in the ancient Near East is that if you share someone's table, that means you, you agree with them in some level. You're, you're, you're in accord. You're in the same boat together. You're on the same page. So I think the lesson is a little hard uh, on these religious leaders because they're just doing what moms for centuries have told their kids, right? We today, we tell, uh, we tell our fellow uh, believers, you know, don't go do that. Don't go see this movie. Don't listen to that kind of music. Don't do this, right? But this is what Jesus is, is doing. He's with the wrong sort of people. And any mom is going to be worried about his soul. Their religion was not, in Finley's words, built on estrangement any more than ours is, any more than any religion is. I mean, look, if you're an Adventist pastor and you're seen, you know, photographed on Instagram out there eating with some porn stars or something, I don't know, you're, you're going to get some hate mail from plenty of Adventists who think you shouldn't do that. I think somehow we managed to praise Jesus' willingness to eat with sinners and tax collectors while rationalizing it as a uniquely Jesus thing. I mean, hey, he's God, I'm not, I can't eat with those people, he can. Like, but the question is, who can't you befriend for the kingdom? And when you do that, yes, people are going to be upset. And then, of course, you have people on the other side who think that offending church leaders is proof that you're on the right track, okay? Sometimes you're not, you're not following Jesus simply because church leaders are upset. Sometimes they're upset because you're a jerk. <laughs> now, the second interesting thing about Sunday are these two metaphors Jesus used to describe his people. Salt, light. Salt savers and saves, light shows the way. Is that how your church is in the world around you or you know, even here in Peoria, is your, is your city happy that you're there when all the lights are huddled together in one spot? It's actually so bright, it, it blinds, it doesn't illuminate. And if you take all the grains of salt and put them in one spoonful of food, it doesn't add flavor, it ruins it. We were meant to spread out. As Finley says, light does not avoid the darkness. So why are we more afraid of what the darkness can do to us than on what we can do to the darkness in Jesus' name? Moving to Monday, where we are talking about the Roman centurion in Capernaum. Jesus tells the man that he hasn't found greater faith in all of Israel. And I love how Finley describes this. There are few things that go as far as a compliment to open hearts for the gospel. In evangelism, it's easy for us to, to look at the bad in others. The Catholics did this in the Middle Ages. The Lutherans believed this error. So on and so on. Fine. But do we, ever talk about, do we ever talk about the good that the Roman Catholics have done in the world? Do we know how to compliment people where they are? A well-timed, well-placed, well-intentioned compliment can do wonders. Do you have a friend who's just really good at compliments? I don't mean a lot of loose praise like, you look nice today. I mean a compliment that just it goes straight to the heart, where, where someone is honestly and sincerely praised for something that matters to them from someone who notices them and loves them. That'd be a fun thing to practice this week. Trucking over the Tuesday, where we begin a discussion on Jesus' healing ministry. We always feel awkward talking about Jesus' healing because, hey, I've never miraculously healed anyone. But the point I want to drive at here is that we need to see salvation as the restoration of the whole person, not just getting them to accept a few ideas about God. Now, this work of saving people is God's work, but we need to be looking for opportunities to help people beyond 
be merely intellectual. God wants to save a man's mind, a woman's marriage, his their, their whole being. That's what we should be interested in as well. And that's something I'm proud to say, that Adventism has contributed to Christianity, even if we haven't always lived up to it. We are always interested in the whole person becoming whole. Well, that's all we got time for this week. So class dismissed, and we'll see you next week. Thank <laughs> you.